Hello everybody, this is Monica Larner. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to another episode of our Italian wine series. Today we will have a really exciting conversation with none other than Ludovico Antinori. Um, he is the man behind a wine that I absolutely love called Ludovico, but he is the human DNA behind many other wines um, that uh, we all know and we will talk about perhaps briefly from Bulgari, uh, of course, Maseto and Ornelaya being among them. But um, I cannot wait to uh, chat with Ludovico. He is a, a wonderfully uh, expressive and charismatic uh, man. Let's see if we find him. I have to look for Ludovico wine. Um, and a great storyteller uh, and someone who just has just so much knowledge on um, Italian wine and uh, uh, basically everything that we love. Here we go, Ludovico Wine. I see the send request. Uh, Ludovico with us, Marchese Ludovico, waiting for Ludovico. I'm so excited. <laughs> I see so many people joining us. There he is. There we are. We made there it. There we are. Welcome. How are you? We made I it. A new mustache. You see, that's the uh, consequences of this um, COVID, COVID uh, retreat. You, you, you don't have many things to do, so even that happened. But it will be gone quick as soon as we are free. I keep it during the pandemic period. It's a, it's a mark it, of the pandemic. And then as soon as COVID is over, going away. Yeah. When, it's, when the, the freedom comes back, the mustache will disappear out. So. Marquesa Ludovico, you look fantastic. You look great. You look all full of, you know, you your too. usual you too, charisma Monica. and energy. <laughs> you, you look very well too. Santa Barbara does well to you. I, I can tell you, you look wonderful also, regardless <laughs> you. of the big fire. <laughs> yes, we've had, we've had an exciting year. I will tell you that, well, of course, we have the pandemic, we have elections, we had fires, yeah. and yeah. on top of it, today is my birthday. So... Is it uh, birth I, today? Today is my Are birthday. You Scorpio? I'm Scorpio, Scorpio, and I am, guess what? I'm 50 today. Cinquanta. Fantastic. Well, thank God I've got a glass of my wine to cheer. <laughs> I don't know if you see it or not, but <laughs> thank you. all the best. You know, stay well and <laughs> stay like that forever. Ciao. Listen, it feels, it feels good. I'm excited. I have all my friends telling me, oh my God, 50 50. But you know what? It feels good. I'm happy to be here and. Uh, what can we do, right? <laughs> Listen, um, so let's start off a little bit. Can you tell put the us... volume a little bit up here? I've got my volume. I wanted to have it a, a little bit more strong because, I, okay, now it's better, the voice. Yes, we can hear you just fine, so that's good. Listen, so tell us a little bit, um, tell us a little bit about how you've been this past year and what have you been up to with all these crazy travel restrictions and... Uh, that's yeah. right. You know <laughs> how much I was uh, traveling and living around the world all the time. And that uh, blockage from March has been a big shock of, of mine because all my routine and my habit has been changed drastically. But, um, you know, when it's a common thing, everybody is in the same situation. It's less painful, I guess, because, you know, talking to my friends and to my associate, they're all in the same condition they have been. And therefore, let's make it easier. Regardless, I'm missing the U.S. a lot because usually at this time of the year, I'm there. And <laughs> so it's the first time I'm not in the U.S. in the fall. And uh, I miss that a lot because I have a lot of friends. Part of my life has been spent there. So I miss that. But um, I'm in Bulgaria. I cannot complain. We are in a very gorgeous area. The, um, the harvest went well. Uh, it, so the... 2020, which is very bad year, at least it gives us a good harvest. I think so throughout mm. the nation. is an, is a national success from north to south, more or less, as far as I understand. Here in Bulgaria, for sure, it went very well. It was a very late harvest, unusual, but the skin of the grape were kind of thick, so they didn't bother a little bit of rain in this fall, and so we're very... That's done, and I'm relieved for that. That's fantastic. Exactly right. Now everything, all the grapes are, are uh, fermentation is over, grapes are in, so it's a good, yeah. good time to, year to just to wait. I know that you said that um, this whole, uh, you're in Bulgari and it's been more kind of family time, I suppose. No? Family, With, uh... family time, absolutely, yes. We all reunite <laughs> here in this area. 
um, near the sea. So it's, uh, you know, it's a gorgeous place. You have been, you know, the area here full of wildlife, nature, which I like a lot. So, and there are not many tourists. So it's a, it's a very nice moment of the year right now. Yes, absolutely. No complaint. Mm -hmm. I cannot complain. No, absolutely. You know, there are people are in much worse condition. The one who lives in the city and they are confined in a small space. The lockdown must be very, very hard for them. I feel sorry for a lot of people. Yeah, I consider myself lucky to be able to walk my dog without asking the permission to the policeman. Of course. Yeah, that's that's a big thing. That's a big, that's the measure of freedom today, right? If you can walk outside your doorway. Listen, and I, I want to welcome everybody that says, I see so many people that are signing on to follow us and I welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. If at any time anybody has any questions, please go ahead and, uh, and shoot and let us know what your questions are. We'll try to answer them. And if you would like, this is something that I have fun doing. Uh, tell us where you're from. Send us a little uh, message saying what country you represent so we can see, uh, we can say hello to all the countries that are, are watching us. And I see a couple of people have sent me birthday wishes, so thank you very much. And uh, listen, so let's start, um, let's start with a little bit of the history of, I know that right now this is an a interesting time because uh, Tenuta di Biserno and Ludovico are kind of going, going through some restructuring. But give us a little bit of history of where you are right now, of the estate that you represent, because you are in Bibona, which is yeah. the village or the municipality adjacent to Bulgari, about a 15-minute drive. I will, I will explain that to you because a lot of, you know, we know so much about it that we think that uh, all the public knows about it. Instead, it's a very un unknown area of Tuscany, I have to say this part, beside the, with the German, Swiss and Austrian public who come regularly here, is not very well known for the rest of the world. So uh, Bibona is north of Bulgari that people know because of the Sassicaia, the Masseto wine that became worldwide famous. Um, and they all came from this area. And um, we just uh, um, uh, decided to start a new venture north of Bulgari, but it's the same terroir, the same microclimate, it's just a commune changes. And uh, we thought, that uh, the terroir of this area of Bibona could be more suited for the Cabernet Franc varietal. And all the project has been um, revolve around that uh, defeat to be able to, to do saint Emilion style, um, using a Bordeaux terminology, a, a saint Emilion style um, uh, approach of viticulturist using Merlot and uh, Cabernet Franc primarily and decrease the quantity of Cabernet Franc to the minimum and using also the Petit Verdot, which does very well here in Bulgaria because uh, it mature and uh, get ripened in October, as in Bordeaux practically uh, they use it for aging purpose. Here instead it gives its touch of exotic touch. So we, the, 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 I praise a lot this Petit Verdot and I use it, we use it to the, in the blend of Lodovico quite extensively, above 10% every year. So it's an ex quite a big uh, percentage of Petit Verdot that we use. And uh, Cabernet Franc is a, is, a, is a defeat, is a challenge. Um, as you know, Monica, the vineyard of Cabernet Franc, I didn't know that so well until I really lived the, the situation uh, that the Cabernet Franc varietal takes longer than the Cabernet Franc to be able to show um, the, the quality of the, uh, or the um, showing the potential that it, the vineyard has, they have. And um, so before eight years old, the vineyard, we didn't know 100% how this Cabernet Franc would have become. Because as with the Cabernet Franc and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot here in Bulgari after four years, um, you can really uh, do extraordinary wine. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you a little tale because it happened uh, two weeks ago. I, one evening I wanted to, to drink a bottle of Orelaya. I went down in my cellar and I did, it was dark. I didn't know exactly what I was pulling out. I pulled out a bottle. I thought it was uh, a bottle of the 90. Instead then, with much of my surprise, I saw the, the vintage was 88, which <laughs> the vineyard at 88, they were five years old vineyards. 
and uh, I, I said to myself, probably I have to go back to the cellar and get another bottle because 88, you know, who knows? It was a risky experience. Instead, I pull out the cork, which was extraordinarily fresh and uh, perfect, uh, the cork itself. Then I sip it and it was a miracle, a fantastic wine. And the vineyards at the time were maximum four years old. So to be able to generate a wine that is 30 years old, with vineyards which are four or five years old, I think so, is a unique, to me at least, it was a unique experience. The wine itself shows so well and so young, so youthful. It didn't have any sign of aging. It was a, so I said to myself, Bulgari, everybody think about Bulgari in the younger vintages, but no one has thought about uh, how old, how age well this wine can mm. and, and how great they become after 10 years. And um, we drink them too early. That's the problem. And whenever they come out, because the quantity are not immense, you know, people have the tendency to drink those wine uh, within five or six years upon release. Instead, they should really age at least 10 years minimum, some of the good vintages. Regardless, this is just an anecdote that shows you, that, that shows me how the, this terroir is extraordinary for the French variety. Because, of course, Italy is full of local varietal and you love them all. I mean, you love them a lot of them. You're fascinated by the local varietal and um, which is great because uh, you, you have so many around from Sicily to Bolzano. But uh, Bulgari has created with my uncle in Cisa, which is a, a unique uh, area, which is unusual. And uh, I think so the, the French varietal that we're using, they express wine uh, that uh, they were not even meant to be that great when they started the project and so they surprised us all the time how great this place is for the and as a small area as you know the all doc of bulgaria is 1200 hectares but the area where the wine become outstanding is probably 400 mm. so we're talking a very very small I knew. Area. Of production, so that's why the wine are rare, and and you know the quantity of wine that the, they not usually for this Ludovico we only make make eight nine thousand bottles a year, so it's a very small quantity. Like in America, not even a boutique wine makes nine thousand. <laughs> they make two thousand a boutique winery. Here, it's less than a boutique. It's a garage, small garage winery. So, of yeah. course, I mean, you just mentioned Sassicaia, which is the kind of the flagship maybe wine, not only of Bulgari, but for all of Italy. And uh, its first commercial vintage was 1968, but the wine had been produced before that as, in an informal manner, kind of, uh, you know, in a, in a friendly way. And that was kind of, you know, the, what started this uh, realization of the potential of this territory, as you mentioned, as the vines get older, as more um, patience and knowledge is put in, suddenly you realize, oh my God, we have something quite special here. But I yeah. wondered, I wanted to jump back a little bit to your choice of um, highlighting Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot, because Obviously, Bulgari is very centered. I mean, there are a lot of high, high profile Merlots, as we know, and Cabernet oh. Sauvignon. Is, was your choice a little bit of a provocation or what was it? It was just... Um, uh, well, uh, it started, strangely enough, um, I have to admit, it started with, uh, with two factors. One was uh, the, the, the company that you like a lot, which is um, Paleo, which is in front of Ornelaya. And they started to have a Cabernet Franc alone, and I was drinking right. that one. I thought it was very interesting uh, and very fascinating. The lovely Cinzia Merli of Le Macchiole, yes, yeah. She makes a beautiful Cabernet Franc, yeah. Yeah, she did well in, uh, even in, in uh, 2017. And um, I'm drinking actually now uh, Lodovico 2017, which is um, very drinkable immediately, as the 16, of course, which was a, a wine that you appreciated a lot. Uh, really? It takes longer time. <laughs> is going to be a wine that you will enjoy it in 10 years. I mean, you can, I know, might not, but you will enjoy it in 10 years. Instead, this one, 2017, uh, is a probably a, a less um, extraordinary wine, but in, drinkable immediately, which I found for Bulgari, this is uh, the advantage. Some vintages, which are probably not the best, they create, they, if you really make a great, great selection, like we did in this vintage, for both Viserno and Lodovico, an extraordinary selection. This is only made, I think, so 4,500 bottles, 
this end of 22,000. So small numbers, but I think so in those small numbers, we have we managed with a terrific selection to extract extraordinary wine. This is a very pleasant wine. Um, Elizabeth just brought it in. I drink it now to your health, to your birthday, but uh, really enjoyable now. I mean, as the other one, I, I put it on the cellar and uh, probably my, my daughter will drink it sometime to, you know, in the future. Uh, but this one is drinkable now, so I can enjoy it in my old age. I can enjoy it now, the 17th. So I found it very pleasant to drink it now, and I enjoy it very much. Of course, in this um, blend, there, there is um, quite a bit of Merlot, because the Merlot did well in 17th, so we used a little bit more Merlot than average, and that's why probably it's drinkable now, because the Merlot, as you know, developed quicker here. Right. And it, that sense of... Uh, you know, fulfillness from the beginning. It doesn't have the tannin that the other Cabernet has, take longer. And so now I'm enjoying for, because of the Merlot percentage, which is a bit higher than usual. But um, normally we, we keep the Merlot down as maximum and we emphasize on the Cabernet Franc as much as possible. And uh, this is was done, I didn't finish the sentence before. When I was walking on the vineyard with uh, Tim Mondavi from the Mondavi family, that then they acquired uh, the company. Um, we were walking with him on the vineyards, and he, is, of course, having grown up in Napa, he has grown up with Cabernet Sauvignon, and that's a varietal that he he knows more than anyone else in the single fashion. And he told me, oh, there is something about Cabernet Sauvignon here that's a bit too herbaceous. You know, I really, if I would be here, I would do a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon in this area. I think so mm. it will... It will, it will, will not have that herbaceous feeling that Cabernet Sauvignon has. And so we were talking theoretically, like two winemakers together. But the remaining my in my ears that and so Cinzia Merli, plus uh, Timon Davi, plus my curiosity to do something different and new. So I decided in the Bizerno project to to emphasize on the Cabernet Franc. And uh, of course, uh, I understand why Cabernet Franc is not so popular. With the with the viticulturist people because it takes years before it gives some results so the investment is not an easy return on the investment and uh, also until it reach ten years old it's very capricious so one vintage it can be very good another vintage it's showing completely different you you have inconsistency in the outcome which that uh, discourage a lot of uh, viticultural people because they don't want to have the risk. But of course, when you pass that stage, and now we are having the results of te passing the nine, ten years benchmark, and we see that this varietal is really give. A, a, I don't know. I really am. I'm very happy about the decision. In conclusion, it, it takes years. So I was very. I had the years of stress to tell you the truth in the past because it was right. not coming the way I, I expected. So patience, I, patience, patience, right? Patience. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, uh, the, but when you when you drink a bottle like the 88 or Nelaya, then I said to myself, see, this is the reward of doing this job. Because it's a, uh, uh, and I was very, very excited to be a winemaker of quality wine. Because when you have an 88 or Nelaya like that, it's such a surprise, such a fulfillment. And that was done with Andre Chelichev also. I was happy to, uh, the legacy of that incredible man who taught me so much. And that wine, we did it together. So it was very emotional, this 88 on the line that I drank. Uh, this is something happened recently, so that's why I'm talking about it. Probably it's a in a week or two, I will not talk about that subject, but because <laughs> it involved Andre Chelichev, it involved the beginning of the project. It was a uh, big sufferance then. We, who knows if the Relia would have had success or not. It was a really early stage. And look at that. After 30 years, it's there, strong, youthful, with a cork that did not even a touch of wine. I mean, it was, I was, I couldn't believe it. It was a, go, a gift from God, really, to have wine or something like that. I have three more bottles, Monica, and I will take it to Rome when you come back. <laughs> I can't I wait. <laughs> I look, I look with the lamp, and I saw three <laughs> bottles. So I take, we drink it together next bottle. We share it. It's oh just, boy! <laughs> an experience. That you. sounds it's wonderful. Listen, I want to, I want to um, say hello to, okay, we, I, I hope I got everybody because there was so much, um, of course, we have viewers from Brazil, Switzerland, I see Italy, Spain, Singapore, Spain. Germany, Sweden, the United States, uh, the Netherlands, 
And my friend Giuseppe is watching as always. Thank you, Giuseppe, for being such a faithful. Grazie, Giuseppe. You're always present. Um, and we're getting a lot of comments. Uh, we have one comment I see um, that we'll get to a little bit later because this has to do a little bit with the restructuring. Somebody asked, why do you have an Instagram account that's Ludovico Wine and not Tenuto di Bizerno? But let's just wait for that for a second because we'll talk yeah. about how this is being restructured. And we, get a, we have a no, lot of comments. Tenuto di Bizerno also because I had this, uh, this new um, site that we just opened with um, Elizabeth and we wanted to, to test the site. That's why we use Ludovico Wine because we wanted to, we have followed a little bit the path of Bonelai with Maceto, you know, to separate a little bit the two the two wines slightly two wines, i see right same uh, same thing but to give to to Lodovic a little bit more attention and in from the beginning to the end because before we we used to have it as a selection from a certain vineyard now we try to have a little bit more vineyard to expanding five more acres so you know there is it needs a little bit of a concentration for this project not just to have it like that casual, a better wine, but we wanted to take care. That's why Elizabeth is coming into the picture, an experienced German lady who is going to, to really to, work, to be the guardian that everything gets done properly, even in the distribution aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, we also have somebody from Montana saying hello. No, Montana. Yeah, Montana. My second home. <laughs> Your second yes. home, Montana. Yes. Because I would... Forza Montana. We also have Russia, Montenegro, and Portugal. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for, for following. But Montenegro. I do want to note that we have a lot of comments um, about your charisma already. We have a lot of people saying, what a fantastic man. What a wonderful, what a wonderful person to listen to. And somebody wrote that he felt that it was a privilege. Um, it was a privilege to be able to hear to hear you speak, especially underlining the fact that you are someone who has broken away from such a storied and important legacy to really carve your own path. And I think that's an interesting jumping point um, from which to kind of ask you a little bit more. I mean, you've, you've alluded to this, but for those of the followers who don't know, um, the Marchese Ludovico Antinori is, uh, in my eyes, and for all of us who follow Italian wine, a genius. Uh, there's really no other word for having created the magic of uh, wines that we love so much, like Maceto and Ornelaya, and now changing over to a whole new project uh, like Ludovico. So it's, it's um, there's so much of the human DNA of, you know, in those wines that is connected to you and to, and to all of Italian wine, because, you know, these are all, you know, all Italian wine is kind of born from, from this patrimony that, uh, that you've, yep. you've created, you know, so it's really, it is well, a privilege. I agree. I agree very much. So why don't we, so you were, you were mentioning a little bit about, okay, let's talk about, um, Let's talk a little bit about your vineyards because I've had the pleasure of visiting them and I know that the main um, body of vineyards is called Bellaria and it's really just over the border from Bulgari to Bibona, which as I said is the village or the municipality immediately yeah. to the north and it's maybe it's, 15 exactly. minutes, 10 minutes away by car, 10, 15 minutes away. It's really just, it's basically... Yes, it is. Uh, in by car it's 12, 15 minutes from uh, Ornelaya to Bizerno, more or less. Uh, it is 15 minute drive. But the, 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 the Bellaria Vineyards is very important, uh, what you mentioned, because according to, let's say, uh, Michel Ronon, which is a consultant and friend now, uh, he considered that Bellaria Vineyards in general to be the, the, really the, the first crew in, in French terms of all mm -hmm. this fine area. He, he thinks that the, the, the terroir, the ventilation, the exposure makes Bellaria producing year after year for the best quality wine that he blends at Ornelaya and at Bizerno because we happen to have the northern side of Bellaria. It's a bit like probably not the same, but let's call it Monfortino and Piemonte. You know, it's a sort of uh, blessed area. Blessed, right. Where blessed terroir, where everything you plant is coming better than the just few uh, meter away, and um, it's a combination, I think, of soil and exposure. There is the summertime, there is ventilation from the inland, who really goes there and keep the temperature always under control. That's one of the reasons. That's why they call it Bell Area, the farmers, because they they were very happy at summertime to have a nice air, fresh air to keep the 
the temperature a little bit down versus their colleague who were living in the lower area where it was extremely hot and unbearable. So Bellaria was the, the people who used to have Bellaria, they were privileged farmers in the sharecropping time because it was an incredible uh, time in the, in the summertime. It you know, was good for them and it's good for the plants as well. The vineyard right. enjoy the same thing, enjoy the freshness. That, that, and it's that another is. one of those those vineyards that has that you see you know in Bulgari and Vibona that kind of perfect slanting towards the Tyrrhenian Sea. So you know yes. I've, I've said this before, but it's something that always catches my eye when I visit. You have these vineyards that kind of slope down to the sea, and you have the luminosity that comes not only from the sun but that is reflected almost off the water and creates this kind of golden basin of light yep. and luminosity. And, and as you mentioned, there's always that soft breeze to keep the vines healthy, to keep, you know, I mean, it's, it's this little bellaria, this beautiful wind movement. You know, there is always there. ventilation there. It's, uh, it's the only place that even in the hottest time of the summer is ventilation at night. It changes from night uh, to day uh, about four degrees, which in, in this area is unusual that, to have that exchange in August. Uh, that's the story of Bellaria. So we happened to have the northern side, and I thought when I planted in the northern side, there was no vineyard planted then, that it would have been uh, very good also because considering the fact that we all are worried about this uh, warming of the, you know, herd, the, 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 the globe, and I said if I planted on the north side, although they are sloping toward the sea as well, but they are a little bit more north, uh, we are we are going to offset the the the, the you know treasures uh, uh, sun of August, but then as funny enough, since that moment that we planted in Bellaria, the temperature has changed, and except 2017 where we had this very very uh, warm August, as you know, uh, lately there there are not so extreme temperature as in the past. Regardless, I think so for the um, Cabernet Franc. To have a little bit on the north exposure, it doesn't do any harm, on the contrary. So this is quite original because in, in Italy, everybody usually planted southwest, you know, it's everything mm -hmm. is southwest, southwest to get the maximum exposure of the sun. And this time, in the, the beginning of the 21st century, we decided to do the opposite, to go northeast. Uh, uh, but it's... Um, it doesn't make a big difference. We just probably uh, harvest five days later than the exposure in the south. But we have both, I mean, in the, in the Bizerno estate. We have the north and the south, not only in the Bellaria, but other parcel. We also have north exposure. And this year they did very well with the Cabernet from the other north exposure. Mm. So we, we, we have both, uh, you know, we wanted to have both possibilities. I mean, to as a... As a Something that in Onelaya we did not have any north exposure. This is something new, this new project. And can you um, characterize a little bit the, um, the sourcing of the fruit for Bizerno and Ludovico? How yes. it works and how, you, and how you identify the two wines? It started the, the, the whole thing uh, from scratch, the Bizerno project, including uh, the other estate called Campo di Sasso, which was the, the first one where we produced it in Soglia del Cinghiale which is a wine that is produced in a different estate, which is lower and... Um, closer uh, to the sea, now a little bit closer, closer to the sea. Closer to the sea, in a, a different type of soil, but Sandia, good for the Syrah, that's why Soil Cinguale has a lot of Syrah in it. And then we, uh, we started to have ready the Biserno, and so we started with Pinot di Biserno, which is the, and the second wine of Biserno, which does, I think so, is a very, very good wine also for the price. Then uh, we went to Tobiserno, which is a classical Bordeaux blend, uh, a little bit like uh, classical Bulgari in the Biserno. We use all the varietal. Uh, and then uh, this Lodovico, which is coming from the, this vineyard that we were talking before, uh, B B Bellaria, we have a predominance of uh, Cabernet Franc and a bit, a bit, a bit of Merlot, the pen of the vintage. The 17 has quite a bit. And um, and then we have the this glorious uh, Petit Verdot, which I'm in love with it because <laughs> it gives that spicy, which I you know I found that makes the, the wine different. You know that you have to have a sort of each project has to have their own uh, style. I think so. Otherwise, there is no reason to make to do such an effort because, as you know, to create a new project in wine, it takes time, it takes money, it takes patience. Uh, 
זה dedication, a total love, and I'm in love with you, the feet, and I love the feet, otherwise I would have stayed in Ornelaya, it would have been easier, but uh, the defeat is so tremendously exciting for me that I cannot resist to, to get another challenge. And this is <laughs> exactly. <the> last, <laughs> my last one, no more challenge. I'm actually slowing down. That's why I'm concentrating more on the Lodovico project right now, and I leave the rest of the estate in the hands of my nephew, which is taking over a little bit. And, um, and I concentrate on the Lodovico because I want to have less, you know, less um, uh, task and less responsibility at this stage of my life. But uh, I so have to, to do... So to recap, you have the Insolio, which is from the... the um, Campo di Sassi. Campo di Sassi, estate. estate. Then from the greater uh, Biserno, Tenuta di Biserno, there is Il Pino di Biserno and then the Biserno wine, the top end wine. Wow. And then now the Ludovico from the Bellaria, the special selection Ludovico will kind of be spun off uh, under your care yes. Yes. as no, its own, totally. as a kind of a headline brand, I guess, or yeah. in the way that even in the way that Maceto kind of is its own identity within the greater Ornelaya estate. Yeah, probably with the idea of having a little uh, winery probably separated in the next years if everything goes the way we expected, because with the funny world we're living in now, we don't know what's happening tomorrow. So I have to, we have to slow down a little bit the ambitions of the right. project. We have to take it easy. Thank God the wine like Lodovico did very well commercially because apparently the collectors and the various different type of clients, uh, we were not so... The, the restaurant, as you know, both in America and in Italy, without the American tourists, with no Russian, with no this, with no that, they had the great crisis this summer the restaurant in Italy, unfortunately, all your friends, and uh, it's, not, it's not a very it's uh, positive time. moment for them, unfortunately. But still, we have those uh, merchants who deal with private collectors, and those are the ones who really were very excited to, to get a Lodovico because they have a different network, uh, completely different from the classical network where you sell to the Vinoteca or Ristorante or Hotel. And they were in a different network, and that went very well during the pandemic because uh, wealthy people stayed at home and they get bored, and so they opened apparently great bottle of wine. And uh, those wine merchants that that kind, uh, the, uh, I cannot mention them, but I have them in mind. They did extremely well. When I talked to them, I, they say they was the best uh, trimester of their of entire life. Uh, they sold so much extraordinary wine. So. Um, you know, in crisis, you have always something happening good. I mean, in every crisis, and so the Lodovico segment seem to to be doing quite good in this moment. Um, so I'm I'm thanking God about that. All the Bizerno <laughs> went good. This, uh, this uh, I have to say, we don't have complaint. But Lodovico, especially because the network of um, of clients, which is different, mm -hmm. uh, we managed to to get all the product. You know, we we don't make much, but at least. In a moment of crisis, you think about will it sell, and it got sold because of you. Also, thank you very much. You're 16 with your <laughs> banking, it went very well, and we. I gave it a nice little high score. Yeah, it was a beautiful wine. I have to say, you know, the I mean, the wines have been just incredible to watch over the last couple of years because. Um, there is, as you mentioned, there is this kind of, you know, uh, quality curve or there's a, there's a, yeah. you know, a, 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 a sense of um, sophistica uh, sophisticated depth and complexity that emerges with each vin Emerge. vintage. And 2016 Emerge. was a vintage that already gave, you know, uh, so much um, a kind of head start uh, yeah. in terms of quality. So, and, but then also the, the 17 is beautiful as well. I mean, there you go. There you go. <laughs> this is the city. This is the one that's been blessed by Monica. Oh, you see, yes, okay, yes, because I had the bottle, but it didn't have. I have the seventeen that has it had written, so I, you know. But that is the that is the uh, the Ludovico right there. Listen, I want to yeah. say hi to BB Greats. I see him following us. I see that uh, Max Arito has been following us. Hello, oh. and somebody from Colombia chimed in. So hello. And um, we had a question a little bit before about visiting the estate. Is it possible to visit the estate? And on yes. that, I would also add, how are um, 
how 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 is the planning going? I've I've had the the honor of visiting the state. It's beautiful, but I know yep. that you back then. This was a couple of years ago. Were in the process of of maybe building a winery and then waiting to see. And how I wanted to know what stage you are. Um, well, then um, we decided to to hold on into uh, from uh, that project that you you saw, and uh, we might keep the way the winery is now, but to make it more complete and uh, more, you know, interesting also for visitors there, to make it more um, uh, a welcoming vineyard. Now it's an operational vineyard with, with a winery with not much uh, charm, but uh, we plan to make it uh, more interesting, the, the, the winery of Biserno. And um, it is uh, the way you came, it's called uh, Biserno uh, Relais, where we have rooms, and uh, the guests are welcome. Elizabeth is organizing that a lot. And she's in front of me. When it's closing, Elizabeth, beautiful. It's very worth going. It's a gorgeous now, spot. When it's closing now, in no, end of and now because of the situation, they are closing now earlier in uh, I think so mid November, and will reopen uh, in um, in March. So it's usually it's open from March to November. And they have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, rooms plus two, extra seven rooms, and um, and it's a very beautiful position and it's a nice place. People sleep well there, and they tell me which mattress do you use, and I told them no, it's not a matter of mattress, it's a matter of position, because the people who built that house they knew about positioning in the proper places, and the position of Bizerno is extraordinary, and all the star are angled in the right way, the moon, etc. And I, the people sleep very well there, and they think it's the mattress. No, it's not the mattress. It's the Bellaria. <laughs> it's the beautiful air, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we also have a question about the, the, the 17 vintage. Um, somebody asked if it was a difficult year, 2017. And I would add on to that, because we, you mentioned this briefly about the fear of climate change. Have you had, this is a question that I've seen has come up in the past quite a bit in other lives that I've done, but have you seen any evidence of climate change in your area or any uh, worries on that front? Yes, we have seen climate changes, especially uh, Monica, uh, the pattern has changed more than, uh, let's say, experiencing those extra warm uh, summer as people uh, had expected. We didn't, ex beside the 17, which had a peak of very warm uh, days in August, the rest of the last five years, uh, it was the pattern is different. This year, for instance, um, the the pattern was very different because we harvest uh, in late uh, September, early October, varietal that usually get harvested at the beginning of September. So we have about 25 days delay uh, because the the beginning the flowering took place and then it was very dry and then it it was a very unusual but healthy summer. The humidity was dead and rain in June and half to keep the moisture on the soil until August. And then it rained in September. We were worried about that rain. But the skin this year was so strong uh, and thick that the, the, the water didn't bother. We didn't need to utilize any mean of upsetting disease or anything. It was a very biological by nature vintage this year. We used very little of what we still use. Very, you know, we are slowing down in everything. We are becoming... Um, sustainable more than we cannot uh, claim to be biological 100 percent, but we are very sustainable in the mentality we use less and less product and which are not uh, natural um, and this year uh, i saw the statistic the other day we have used very little of anything i was a very blessed by that point um, and uh, so different but sometimes not for the worst you know the pattern can change the pattern of the weather but uh, this 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 year changes the maturity started later, the, the, excuse me, the flowering started later, the maturity was, uh, took forever to mature, it was a very weird, you know, even for the, but in a positive way, thank God, not in a negative way, like for us. How is the situation with the COVID in California? It's completely disappeared by now, or you still have a little bit of it? We have, we have, uh... We have a growing number in California. It's actually where I am. It's in a rural area, so it's been um, it's been okay. But I mean, in generally, the the national statistics have been growing every day. So you know, yeah. I mean, now we're in the middle of this you know election uh, mystery. So 
nobody's even talking about other current events or COVID right now because everybody's just wondering who's going to be the next president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is so many things going on at once. There's too much going on. You turn so, on the news like ah. <laughs> why? Uh, the thing has been, you know, it's very. It's a strange. 2020 is a year too that we we will forget. I guess, so. so. Hopefully we, soon. We try, Hopefully we try soon. to forget, and I hope to look forward to, to over twenty-one, probably with a vaccine or whatever coming along. Because and a new I start. For, um, for the, the new great, start. population, if they will not have a vaccine, they will. It will be very difficult to keep everything under control. So the vaccine seems to be the answer right now for calming down this terrible virus, which is a. Uh, uh, so worldwide, it's like we we in Italy we consider it a war. We consider a silent, invisible war because we don't know where the enemy is and which weapon they use because the enemy somewhere is absent and the weapon that they use is invisible. So it's a very tricky type of war. You cannot really defend yourself like if it would be a traditional war. But it's a kind of war in the sense that uh, we pay the consequences. People are dying and, and there are businesses uh, collapsing. And so it is a mm. war. Actually. It is a war. Yeah. And people as you know. in I say in every war that people are losing the life and people are making a lot of money. So it's a very unjust type of situation. I see the stock exchange already after the election have gone up today a lot. It and went so, up. It went, I mean, that's incredible. I think it, it went up because there's there is a some kind of, um, I guess, comfort in knowing that the government might be you know, divided between whoever has the White House and the Senate. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure. It's it's a strange. It's and you can't. I mean, you can't. You have no idea. <laughs> everything yeah, this year, everything you think is going to happen yeah. doesn't happen. You know, everything very is crazy. Type of election, also very strange type of election. I know, I know. It's very yeah. It's, you know, I, it's in tune with the, the the strange years that we are. I but I think that you know, just just to you know, finish up on the, also the discussion of COVID. You know, this is something that that you know everybody has has said. But the way Italy reacted um, in such a dramatic fashion, with so much courage um, and so much determination, especially in those lockdown months, has been a source of inspiration. I think for many, because that really, yeah. that, I can't I, imagine the discipline, the discipline, that, you know, of the Italian people that came out that, in such. It, it, <laughs> Very Splendid for. <laughs> That's why you know you can make the comparison. Japan has very little cases because they are basically their uh, way formal education does allow them to hug, to to shake hands. There is always a distance between human being. The way that they eat, the way that they use the mask mm -hmm. since mask ever. Use, yeah. So in Japan, that's something that they absorb easily, as in Italy, that people, hey, come stai, you know, it's impossible. <laughs> baci, baci, baci. <laughs> baci, point, they take your arm and they do this, and it's very physical uh, culture, the very physical way of exchanging socially. So to to interrupt that. It's better to keep them in the house, probably, because at least they will hug the, the cat or the dog. They know, you know, they are, the children probably say, do you have the tampone? Okay. Tampone <laughs> then you can come in, right? We have also have the tampone. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to have mine. Tomorrow morning. Are you... <laughs> Marquesa <laughs> Ludovico, I have to, we have to tell the story. If we're talking about introductions, let's tell the story about how you and I met many, many years ago. <laughs> ah, yes, when we met together. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, that's an amazing story that my daughter <laughs> reminded me, although she was five years or six years old. She was young. <laughs> in Italy, that she attended. She was a little bit shocked by all the people. And then... Uh, and the crazy, the way, in Italy, you know, the masses of people coming in and out of those huge... Uh, can you imagine in Italy now with the COVID, that would be impossible. Um, <laughs> and uh, when we um, uh, end up at the taxi line, the queue to get a taxi was very difficult in Italy. My daughter and I, we started gossiping a little bit about the people who were exposing the wine nearby, the people who came, you know, the typical gossip Italian style after an event like in Italy, where you see so many people. And all of a sudden, I heard a little giggling on the back. So I turned <laughs> abruptly and I saw this beautiful face of a lady, which I understood. She was probably not Italian, but she spoke Italian eventually. <laughs> and so we start interacting and then it ended up to be Monica. She was <laughs> behind me listening all those terrible things that I was say, telling, saying with my daughter about other uh, producer probably and, um, <laughs> and she will start laughing because we were probably right somehow 
And so we became, we got acquainted and became friends. We exchanged our card and she, you were working with the other publication then. I was working for the white enthusiast. We were waiting, exactly, we were waiting in a taxi queue and I was standing there and I'm like, oh, that's, that's Ludovico Antinori. And then, and then I was over listening. I said, oh my God, oh my God, this is good. This is good. <laughs> and then finally I have to say, I have to introduce so myself because it's unfair, you know, that, oh <laughs> that I'm, oh, I'm eavesdropping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's something I will never forget, Monica, because it's one of the... Be careful what you say in the taxi queue. Be careful. <laughs> that's the yeah, because we took the taxi together. We shared the taxi. Yes. We... yes we went By that to point, the... because the thing about the Vanitaly taxi queues is that they are literally like a three-hour affair. So by the time you finish the queue, you become, yeah. you, become yeah. you know, family friends with everybody around you. <laughs> That's just like the most original way to have met uh, Monica, I yeah, think so, so yes. in my life and your, <laughs> your life as well. It was very amusing. Then we didn't see each other for one year, then we got to, we became friends after that. Yeah, I know, it's been oh, fantastic. Now I'm back, back mind to that moment that we got acquainted. I think it was <laughs> very funny. And we, I remember the face when I turned your face smiling, ir ironic that you have. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> Listen, I have the next question I want to ask you, and I'm going to make it a little bit harder. So taking away Tuscany, um, what are some of the, the wines that most inspire you from Italy? And then I'll ask you the second question. What are some of the wines from the world um, that have given you inspiration and kind of put you on your path uh, yeah. as a winemaker? Well, the past, you know, the... Um... Now probably I've got different wine than I had then, but uh, you wanted to know the one that inspired me at the Ornelia days or the one that inspired me right now? Well, let's do both. Yes, let's do both. Well, of let's course, see what the change is, yes. <laughs> inevitably, it's very, it will disappoint probably a lot of viewers, but uh, the inspiration when I started with Maceto, of course, was Petrus. That is inevitably because I was really there, 100% Merlot in a, in a clay, magical hill what mm. else could inspire so um, the pomerol in general but in particular i was ignorant i didn't know much about many wine of pomerol at the time um, i remember that I, I when i was very young in, in philadelphia uh, i was selling antinori wine and uh, in a shop they had a bottle of petrus which i vaguely knew and they told me if you give me three bottle of uh, Villantino Reserva and uh, fifty dollars cash, I will never forget. I give you the bottle of Petrus, which was sixty one. You remember the famous sixty one that there was considered, a, you know, incredible vintage. What a terrific and exchange! <laughs> brought it back with me in a suitcase, and it stays and it's still down in my cellar. I never want to touch that. But the origin, the origin was in a in a shop in Philadelphia. It's a funny story that. And, um, and then uh, Petrus was a little bit the, the inspiration for, for, uh, for Maceto. As uh, for the wine today, I would say that um, uh, probably Saint-Emilion wine uh, from Bordeaux uh, have been an inspiration, but now I'm more uh, drinking wine, which um, organic wine. And I have my nephew that you probably know, Piero Incisa, the one who lives in New York, who has done that wonderful uh, project in Argentina called yes. Chuck. Mm -hmm. He's a total um, uh, bio, bio dynamic uh, type of winemaker. And he's teaching me a lot in that. And he gives me a lot of extraordinary wine from France and from Austria. And uh, Elizabeth, which is in France for me, I discover a wine from Austria, which is called uh, uh, Moritz. Moritz. Moritz, the producer. And he does a Blau Frankish which is an extraordinary, amazing wine. Uh, and uh, he, Piero gave it to me, and now I understand it also. Elizabeth, she knows the producer very well, and we just ordered a case of 12 bottles, and I'm going to drink it in the next uh, this <laughs> pandemic period, <laughs> quarantine. I'm going to drink that wine. It's a Blau Frank, it's from Austria, made by this Moritz, Mr. Moritz. And uh, he is absolutely 100% uh, biodynamic. And the wine I opened it, and because I was drink less than before, I, and I was alone these days, so I kept it for five days, and it was absolutely good after five days. Amazing wine, really good. And then um, uh, also, uh, it's not that that wine in, don't inspire me because it's in another league, but they 
tell me a lot and I'm learning a lot and also I think so they are very gentle with the liver somehow uh, because I see that I metabolize them very easily as other wine which are probably even tastier but they don't have that that quality so it's mm. important to reach a certain age to drink wine that you understand that your liver metabolize them quicker the somehow the alcohol is a little bit uh, different uh, than the one that we traditionally make so it's a, it's a new discovery but in the in the sense of uh, let's say traditional wine at the moment what i'm uh, drinking uh, and inspire me a lot is um, the wine of um, uh, of that lady, uh, Cinzia Merli. Paleo. Uh, I think Paleo, so. Yeah. Paleo, yeah. Very nice wine. I like it very much. And I also have to say the wine that my brother is making. It's called Matarocchio, which is a Cabernet mm -hmm. Ua, which is actually produced next to Bellaria. That's why. <laughs> 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 they, they managed to make an extraordinary wine. I think to one of the best wines I ever drank from Antinori, this uh, Matarocchio. Cabernet yeah, I, it's gorgeous. I represent the varietal in an extraordinary way. There is no Merlot in it. as a pure Cabernet Franc and it's, it's absolutely stunning. In the 2016 vintage, I don't know about other vintages. I drank only, Monica, the 16 vintage of that wine. Mm -hmm. It was really a surprise. And then, uh, you know, I drink a lot of Cabernet Franc at the moment because I wanted to see what's going on around here and from other parts of the world. So, um, beside the, the Saint Emilion, which is a blend with Merlot, uh, pure Cabernet Franc, they are not easy to, to get uh, to find very good Cabernet Franc pure. It's difficult. It's a varietal that uh, you don't, you know, I. That's why we want to do something here special, because I think that this area will produce Cabernet Franc of extraordinary quality versus the competition as well. So um, the next project will be probably we will make an, a, a little production. Michel Rong decided 2,000 bottles out of a, of a vineyard next to, to that of Bellaria we located. And it's going to be um, 100 percent Cabernet, Cabernet Franc without uh, having the addition of Merlot and uh, and Petit Verdot, and uh, this is the, my last challenge to do that. When we are as a project on, ongoing right now, with the 2020, we will be able to. 2020 will be the first. Yeah, 2000 will be the first vintage. That and do you do you have a name for that wine yet, or is it too early? Um... No, we have three names at the moment, but you know, all those names, they have patent banding from other people. I mean, it seems like we cannot find any name in, in Italy that is still available because everybody has used all kinds of names. But, but uh, I have, no, but I have one already, which I like, and then I'm looking for two more, and then I will send them to Charles House, which is my beloved uh, design of label, which I've been working with him, is from Santa Rosa, California, and I've been working f with him since the early days of Ornelaya. All my label has been designed by him. He's a very mm -hmm. renowned designer uh, in California, in the world. It's called Charles House. He's very re re reclusive, hard to get. It took me six months to get to, to know him because he was working in a company in Santa Elena, and they did the, the uh, label of Frog Leap. And I found that label of Frog Leap to be extraordinary back mm -hmm. then. Right. <laughs> but that then was really striking. So I wanted to know who did that label. And it came out always that was a graphic company from Santa Elena. So the, I went to the graphic company. Who did that label? No way to know who did it. We did it. We. I said, but who was the person? You, if it's possible to know. No, no. We, they wouldn't release the name. So went by and I asked a lot of people and everybody was kind of elusive. I couldn't get and I got really stubborn at that point. I wanted to know who did that label. And six months later, at least, probably more, I understood from, um, from a guy who was engraving the knife, can you imagine? Engraver that does the engraving to produce the label of uh, Bordelaya, which was done by an engraver of uh, Napavelli. A man who engraved guns, you know what I mean? Engraving in the metal. Right, right? in the metal, right. That guy knew because he had worked with Jordan label. He, Jordan is the one American wine that you wine. probably know. Uh, he did the label of Jordan and he knew that that man has moved away from the company and he was on his own. So he said, I can probably give you the, the number. He's very, very shy. So I call him 
and I heard a voice, very timid, elusive. He didn't want to really to have a social inter interaction with anyone. But I said, I really am an admirer of yours. You did Frog Leap, didn't you? Yes, I did. Oh, finally. So when, when can we meet? So we met uh, a week later. I was spending quite a bit of time in, in California at the time. And uh, we established a relationship. And he started with Don Elia. And he did that wonderful label called Poggio Legazzi, which was a white wine produced mm -hmm. at Aya Sauvignon Blanc at the time, which got a, a prize, a graphic uh, design in the Museum of Lausanne, Switzerland, where they have a graphic museum, only of graphic art. And that label of Poggio Legazzi is exposed in a wall as a graphic achievement of the year. That not thank to him, not to me. And uh, so from that moment, every label, Maceto, everything was done by him. So Can the, you show us the Ludovico label again, if you have the bottle? Um, yes. Because it has this beautiful, fine, this fine kind of graphic quality. Up a little bit more. Oh, yes, you see? Yeah, you can see it there. Like that beautiful, it's, it's very elegant, very beautiful. That was done by him in a sort of minimalistic. Uh, minimalistic, of, very yeah. clean. Listen, and now I have another which is involved in the company also. My daughter, Sophia, who lives in London, she told me, if we do this wine, uh, the small uh, numbers of bottles, let's do it an, an important label, eh? because she, she feels like... Maybe you could call the new wine Sophia. <laughs> well, she has one called Sof, which is the rosé wine, which we right, make. Right, so you're right. Us, right so still. Say, Listen, I, I have... So we were talking... When we talk about Cabernet Franc, I have a question... Um, yes. you know, we, we mentioned uh, Paleo and, you know, the, the other great Cabernet Franc uh, expressions um, okay. from your area. And, of course, now, you, now you're going to have 100% Cabernet Franc. What, what is the, how would you characterize the Italianita or the Italian character of, the, of Cabernet Franc made in your area? I mean, because tasting through Cabernet Franc from other parts of the world, what makes it specifically Italian? Or... Yes, well, um, yeah, uh, make it modern Italian, really, the Bulgaria area, because this is unique, as you know, the unique area, so I would call it uh, Medit no, Tyrrhenian Sea, coastal Tuscan coastal area. Coastal Tyrrhenian, yeah. Alta There's Marina. like a softness, I guess, or like, a, you know, this Macchia Mediterranea, there's like a... Um... Because we are in a coastal area here, because most of people probably don't know where we are located, we are in the coastal area in front of Corsica, uh, as a matter of, of fact, today I went on a boat and for a couple of hours and uh, Corsica is exactly 55 miles away from here. And um, what um, uh, makes this Cabernet Franc so different and, I mean, uh, you know, special, let's call it special. Uh, you, it is the, it's difficult to describe it actually now on a live um, situation uh, Monica like we are now exactly what I I know exactly what I what I mean uh, in my palate knows it but uh, the my palate doesn't know how to talk and I have a difficult <laughs> time to, to 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 get words the receptors it receives it receives <laughs> right it's receptors. <laughs> a different um, is a definitely uh, unique taste that I presume will not be appreciated by most uh, wine drinker, but wine lover, it will be more of a specific um, uh, type of public that is ready for that. Uh, it's not commercial, let's call it. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone. Because it has character that you have to be ready to appreciate them. If you give it to someone who doesn't have that readiness, he probably say no, because it's not an easy wine to drink. Uh, it, uh, you know, like everything that has to do with taste, with smell, it's very personal. You cannot generalize uh, the taste. You can do it. The Merlot is a varietal that pleases a lot of palate, as we know. But the more you go into the specific um, uh, varietal, like the Cabernet Franc, mm. it, it gets, unless it's blend, like they do in France, they blend it and so they make it much more you know, with uh, like Cheval Blanc, one of the best wine in the world. It has a great percentage of Cabernet Franc, but it's, it's also helped by a little bit of Merlot, the terroir, the area, of course, where it comes from. But I think so here it would be different from that. It would be a distinctive Cabernet Franc pure, which is sell very often not pleasant. I think so the wine that we produce here, they will be pleasant, 
like uh, for you probably and uh, for other people who have a mature uh, sense of drinking and mature palate, but not for beginners. And we'll know that's why we make sort of 2,000 bottles only because um, it will not be a wine for everyone. I don't know if you follow me in that. Yeah, no, I think there's that, you know, there's always that kind of, um, you know, this intersection between power and elegance, you know, and getting getting the right, um, you know, finding that right point, especially in a grape like Cabernet Franc is very important. But, you know, there's always, there, I always, uh, I always remark that there, there is something that, to be recognized, you know, and I, I think maybe it's knowing the area. And, and again, this kind of idea of the Macchia Mediterranea, this kind of um, saltiness that comes off the sea, this, uh, you know, there, there's something so Tuscan. Uh, Cabernet Franc local it has absorbed some local character. To uh, very much so. <laughs> itself in an original way. I agree with you. It's probably, you know, sometimes I forget about that. I take it for granted, that aspect. But it's definitely very present, the, the, the location, the terroir where it comes from. And there will be a blend of things that will make it so special. I think um, <clears throat> those Cabernet Franc will be, um, if, if they're made well, like uh, in Matarocchio 16, is an incredible expression. And I have to praise Mr. Cotarella to have achieved something like that. Um, and uh, we will, uh, the next project of ours will be in that range. We will make a group of aficionados or people who will, uh, you know, will look forward to that particular wine. It will not be um, that they understand, they appreciate it like uh, other, uh, you know, as a classy, because the varietal is very classical varietal, is a very elegant varietal, but uh, grown here in pure form, uh, it become very stylized uh, in a very special way. Is not uh, made for pleasing everybody. I don't know if you. I try to pass that message, not to right. an anti-commercial message in a way, <laughs> but it's the truth. You know. Right. You there is a personality. There is a strength of personality. That's why I had some clash with Michel Rolo in the past because I wanted to make it even Ludovico a little bit more in that direction. But often he think about, you know, he has a school from the founder of your magazine to be able to make wine that they are uh, broadly acceptable. See, that was right. a lot, lot of time. And he was right, probably, <laughs> because the wine that he helps to make, to put together the blend, they are always uh, very well made and extraordinary wine. But uh, when you want to make something a little bit of that beaten path, he is reluctant to do it himself because he's afraid they will not be successful with the public. But I said, I, I have to do before I die something that I don't care if it's successful or not. I want to follow my instinct like I always have done in the previous experience. I have to follow my instinct. My instinct drives me there to, to, to follow in that direction that uh, Matarocchio, I have to say, has as a benchmark for me at the camp. Uh, you know, I'm very happy that my family, I can say something extremely positive about my family wine because it doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> In this case, it does happen from my heart. Well, that is fantastic. And I uh, listen, on that, on that note, we've come up to even a little bit over an hour. And I have to thank you so much for this fascinating um, conversation that was just, you know, this is so genuine and, uh, and, and full of, 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 of your lovely character, which has just made the time go by very quickly. And I think we've, we've received so many different comments and uh, so many, you know, uh, questions and whatnot. Obviously, the, the video will be recorded and put on the site, hopefully in a few minutes. I'll do that now. So, um, Marquesa Ludovico, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everybody. And I hope to see you very soon in Italy. <laughs> yes, I do hope so too. And uh, I think so. I'm expecting to see you in 2021. Let's pass the year. And it will be more positive to see in 21 than in this 20. Stay a little bit longer in Santa Barbara than in 21. We will drink the only like 88 together. The 88. Celebrate Wonderful. Your... I can't wait. I book my, booking my flight immediately. So <laughs> we, will, we will celebrate your birthday. Ludovico is the best. Everybody's writing. Thank you. Thank you. I think this went very well. Thank you, Ludovico. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll, and see, we'll talk soon. 2021 in Roma. <laughs> bye, At bye. Roma. Ciao, ciao, grazie.